In 2015, Pixar released a movie that was unique. It was very different compared to the other things they had done so far because it was from the perspective of human emotions. In this show, or in this movie, we meet fear, anger, joy, disgust, and sadness, who all represent the emotions in one Midwest girl named Riley. The story focuses on her struggles as her family moves from Minnesota to San Francisco, and the emotions that she has in the midst of the transition and change from one place to another. The move is difficult for Riley, we learn, because everything that has built her personality thus far, her core memories is what they call them, were built in Minnesota. And when she moves to San Francisco, all of those core memories are challenged. Her friendships, her family, her sense of humor, the hobbies she has, all of those are challenged. And so in the midst of struggling with all of the differences of change in moving, she continues to look back and look back at what her identity was, where her family was, what was, and isn't ready to shift and change into the new place. So her emotions build a great plan for how to solve this problem. Let's take a look at what they decide. Verses 23 through 25. 
and we will deal with them accordingly. Starting in verse 14. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also testifies to us, for after saying that this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts. I will write them on their minds. He also adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. For where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. What I love about this passage is it kind of reflects back to the structure of Deuteronomy that we looked at a couple weeks ago, where Deuteronomy gave us like these core points to think about and then a practical step of what how we're supposed to do it. But here we're starting out with this thought of Christ's actions, Christ's sacrifice made us perfect and is making us holy. That this is changing the way we are, we orient. This, there's a fun word that we use in seminary for this called the already, not yet. Because of what Christ has done, we are already acceptable to be in the presence of God. We are already made perfect. Yet, we are in the process of being made holy. That we are in this dichotomy of perfect and imperfect at the exact same time. Because God is working on us. That what Christ has done has finished it. It's taken care of. But each of us are in the process of being made new by that truth that happened thousands of years ago. This already not yet is where we are living within. He made us perfect, but we are being made holy. Or in the text I read, it said sanctified. So we see this old covenant that was talked about in Deuteronomy um, and in, throughout the Old Testament of the idea of sacrifices, that a priest has to sacrifice for the sins of Israel for them to be washed clean. And now in Hebrews, we see there is no longer a need for sacrifices because what Christ has done has fulfilled the sacrifice. You will not find a more perfect sacrifice than Christ to fulfill the needs of his people. That happened way before we were even a thought or a twinkle in our parents' eyes. We were already made clean before we were even part of the breath of our parents. Yet, we are in the process of being made holy. We are in a transforming process. What also echoes here in the midst of all of this is in Deuteronomy, we hear this truth being expressed and then the practical steps of remember it. Do you remember us talking about this? Remember it. If you need to, write it on your arm, tie it to your forehead, put it on your door frame of your house, gates, wherever will help you remember who you are and that you belong to me. And again, we hear in Hebrews, I'm going to write this on their hearts. I'm going to write it in their minds. God wants us to remember this, to be identified <coughs> by this. That this is a way for us to orient ourselves, that we have shifted our existence. <laughs> I watched that happen and it was just so, I saw her face with the cue and it was like, there was, was, there was no way you could help it. It was a slow moving action. Oh, poor little girl. But in the, God wants us to remember this truth. 
Write it on our hearts, on our minds, whatever will help us to cling to this truth of who we are, that Christ died and sacrificed for us. We can now approach the throne of God, and God has forgotten our sins. The ones that have happened, the ones that are happening now, the ones that might happen in the future, they're done, they're taken care of. It's been finished already by Jesus. This is a truth, a hope we cling to. But it's easy to think, oh, sweet. Well, if Jesus already took care of my sins, well, let's live it up. Right? I mean, it's been forgiven anyway. The fun part is, if you were to read the Greek, in, so Paul refers to this in Romans, where he says, should we live in sin since God has already forgiven us? And he basically... Let me censor myself, because they didn't put it that way in the, the translation. But they, he basically says, heck no. For some reason, that's not in Scripture. I'm not really sure why they didn't translate it that way. But Paul says, no. Just because you're forgiven doesn't mean you get to live it up crazy. You're supposed to be changed by this truth. The fact that he's forgiven you leads to gratitude. Leads to different living. Just like the fact that we have been blessed to live in a free space doesn't mean we get to just do whatever we want here, but we live out the gratitude by taking care of this space, right? We were talking in Sunday school today about the fact that some people don't take care of the farmland and just throw mattresses or trash cans or whatever on the side of the road. Because they're like, yeah, it's fine. I get to do what I want and I live here. But when we, when we are grateful, when we take in this information of a gift we've been given and are grateful, it changes how we live. It shifts us. And so God forgets our, our sins and our lawless deeds, not so that we can keep going on, but because he's giving us a reset button to do differently, to be changed, to start over. And so, in Hebrews, he gets practical. We've got this thing to cling to, this truth to cling to, and then he gets practical. Let's look at verses 23 through 25. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope, that, that forgiveness we receive in Jesus, that's our hope, of our hope, without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. We see here that the author gives three commands of what to do as, we, as we've learned a truth, what to do now. Just like Deuteronomy had the truth that our God was one and we were to remember that, find it wherever we could to remember it. In Hebrews, he's saying, hold tight to the hope you have been given. That forgiveness you have already received, cling to it, cling to that truth and let your life be oriented around it. Your salvation is through Jesus Christ, which gives you the ability to be in the presence of God. The one who is holy can see those who are unholy because of the salvific act of his Son. We now have the right to be in the presence of perfection in the midst of our imperfection because of what Jesus did. We don't need somebody else to mediate for us. We can just be in his presence. Cling to that truth. Cling to that hope. And as we cling to that, he says, think of ways to motivate each other. Motivate each other to what? Acts of love and good works. So, you know, earlier we were talking about the fact that we were forgiven. So we don't just get the freedom to live it up. Right? Because he says here, you're supposed to motivate each other to good works and love. 
We've been forgiven. That doesn't mean we get to be jerks to everybody we meet. It means we are changed and show that change to the world by acts of love and good works. Not that it means we have earned God's favor by those things, but it is a reflection of gratitude for what he's already done. Already done. We don't earn brownie points, as we've talked about before, by doing things, but we reflect gratitude by living differently because God forgave us. God gave us new life and is changing us. And so the author of Hebrews here is talking about the fact that we are to pattern ourselves off of Christ. We are to live our lives differently by knowing Christ and to provoke each other to do this as well. So in the midst of the gift of salvation, God also gave us the gift of community. The last command he says is to not neglect to meet together. This space where we rub shoulders is a gift that God gave us, where we encourage each other and remind each other and provoke each other to those acts of love and good works. Where we meet and we talk and we say, I'm here for you. You're struggling, let me bring you food. Let me sit with you in your grief. Let me celebrate in your joy. We're here as a family together. God gave us this gift of the church as part of the gift of salvation so that we continue in this process of being made holy. <clears throat> it's part of our new identity. Not to do things on our own. It's not just about me, but it's about us now. We don't just focus on ourselves, but we have a broader spectrum of focus. of shown love globally. So in Inside and Out, Riley's core memories were focused on the past. They were in Minnesota, good old Midwest state. They were in Minnesota. And that's where her identity was built, and things were crumbling, and she decided to run away to go back to the place that gave her all of her great identity pieces, the best memories she had. But in the midst of running away, she realizes, oh my goodness, this is a terrible idea, and runs back home. Mostly because joy and sadness finally get back to the rest of the, the group. But let's see what happens when joy and sadness are back with anger and fear and disgust.
You know what? I miss Minnesota too. I miss the woods and we took hikes. And the backyard where we used to play. Spring Lake, where you learned to skate. When she embraced her community instead of trying to figure it out on her own, healing was able to happen for her. And if you watch the movie, she ends up finding her space in San Francisco. Like she's able to adjust to this new identity. <coughs> Hebrews, in the, the book of Hebrews, he's trying to communicate the fact that there's a new identity for these believers to orient themselves around. They don't have to do the sacrificial system anymore because they've been forgiven. And that if they have a tough time remembering this, go to community and you guys can remind each other. If writing it on your arm or on your forehead or on your wall isn't enough, go to your community and they can help you remember who you are and who you belong to. Community is a key aspect of our faith. That's where we get our support and encouragement. God gave us this gift as part of our salvation. He said, life is going to be hard, but I'll give you the church as a place for you to love and grow. You'll fight too, because that's what siblings do. If anybody's ever had a sibling or a friend like a sibling, you just know that you fight. But the church is there ultimately to be your family here. We learn about God's character so that we can reflect God's character. And God is community in himself. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is one. We are one church. We are community together reflecting the image of God as we work together, as we remind each other why we gather together, as we focus our identity so that we can go out and share that message and reflect God's character to the world. Community is key to reminding ourselves of our identity. Riley needed community to lift her up when she was questioning what it meant to be her. When hockey was hard in California, when her friends were far away and she was in a new school, she needed her family to remind her. And sometimes we forget our value and we need the church to remind us. We forget our truths and we need to be reminded. Community is part of how we reflect God's character. Let's pray together. God, this world tells me that I am my own and all I need is to make decisions on my own. I'm independent. I'm strong, and I can do it by myself. But Lord, sometimes I can't. Sometimes I forget my value. Sometimes I forget my strength. And I need people to remind me. I need to be reminded of my purpose and my intention in this world. Lord, I pray that you move in your churches and in liberty specifically, that we are filled with your spirit to give each other grace and encouragement and guidance as needed. 
that we are a family acting as one together. Not always agreeing, because I know that that's not how families work, but that we are always there to support and love each other first and foremost. Lord, I pray you fill us with your grace so we are able to do that in the midst of whatever comes our way. May we be a people that remembers who we are together so that we may go out and remind others of their value. Lord, we thank you for the gift of your son and the right that he gives us to approach you. That we can talk to you because of what Jesus has done and that our lives have been changed by what he did so long ago. We are grateful. And we celebrate that. In your name I pray. Amen. Let's stand and join hands together to celebrate the community that we have together.